Um, welcome. It's so good to see a full room of people. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Tom Evers. I'm the executive director with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. This is our first Next Generation of Parks event in person since 2020. Yes. And our speaker at that time, who was going to be coming in uh, that spring, was Mick Young Kim. So we are so thrilled that she was able to wait a couple years and, and come. Um, before we introduce the program, I want to just, um, and, and Mick Young is going to talk, her program tonight is Play and Restoration in Our Post-Pandemic World. Uh, and I think uh, we're all ready to start thinking about what the, what the future looks like. Um, uh, it's great to have everybody together. Before we get started, I want to thank a few folks, talk a little bit about the Parks Foundation, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to the presentation. Um, I want to thank our, our sponsors. Minnesota Public Radio has been a, a true uh, uh, valued sponsor, uh, and including uh, bringing along with Alex Cipolloni, uh, Cipo, uh, Cipolli as our, as our uh, in, uh, interviewer, um, and we really appreciate that sponsorship. Um, University of Minnesota College of Design and School of Landscape Architecture, thank you so much for uh, partnering with us. And Bar Engineering for sponsoring the next generation of event of uh, Parks event series. Um, also, our generous donors. These are meant to be free. That is one of the, uh, the theories of the next generation of Parks. Make it free so people can come and hear it. And our donors, all of you, many of you who support us, help allow us to do that. So thank you. Um, a little bit about the Minneapolis Parks Foundation, for those who don't know. We are an independent nonprofit. Our mission is to transform human lives through parks and the public realm by aligning philanthropic investment with community vision. Uh, we uh, work closely with our public partners, particularly the Minneapolis Park Board, which runs one of the best park systems in the country, and in every aspect of their work, they are looking to do it, to, to, to be the best, and they really are. The staff, the leadership, it, we are lucky to have the system, and we are lucky to have the, the people who run the system today. Um, and we have many other partners, the city, the University of Minnesota, the county, um, and we work under the theory that we believe that parks connect us, they heal us, they make us whole. This year marks actually the 20th anniversary of the Minneapolis Parks Foundation being founded. It's also the 140th anniversary of the Minneapolis Park System getting established. Um, and we are ready to do even more. This past couple years, we've celebrated the opening of waterworks in the Central Riverfront, the Overlook at 26th Avenue, uh, several parks, and many, many investments through the People for Parks Fund. Um, but we're just getting started because we know that great parks make great neighborhoods, great neighborhoods weave together into great cities. Um, and we're celebrating all of the benefits that parks bring. We organize our work because of the why of parks. Why do parks matter? There's really five, th uh, five uh, themes that we look at of why we want to get involved, what makes, why, where parks can transform lives. One is done well, thoughtfully. Parks can be a tool for advancing equity and cultural inclusion. They haven't always been in the past, but we believe they can in the future and, and do. They foster community health and well-being. They are really where we uh, get to, to live wholly and, and healthfully in a city. They deepen connections just to the natural world, just for that purpose alone is meaningful. They strengthen our city's ability, ability to be climate resilient, and they spark economic vitality. We have a bold vision for how we can support um, these ambitious ideas, and uh, we just, uh, our board just approved a strategic plan, and in the next coming months, we're looking forward to sharing more about that in, and sharing how everyone can get involved so that we can do even more. But in order to think forward, we also do need to think about the past and reflect on it. Um, we stand on native land. We stand, Minneapolis is the homeland of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe, and we cannot forget that, among many other indigenous nations. Our city was born out of trauma, and we've added to that trauma intentionally with decisions that are uh, harmed by exclusion, uh, racist land policies, and outright violence. These are also facts that we need to come to terms, and we do believe parks have a role in helping heal some of this trauma, and I think tonight we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're excited. We owe it to ourselves and to generations yet unknown to begin that work of healing. And parks and place have, a, have that power. 
We've been offered this moment to reset. As we've said, we've just come back. We can't just come back and begin as we were. This is a moment for us to think differently. We were just talking. Some of the presentations we were giving three years ago, we look at them and we need to think differently. What are we doing now? Let's take that moment. This is a great opportunity that we have. And so that's what we're doing tonight, is we're going to start to think. And we believe that it's thinkers and designers and advocates who will show the way, people like Mick Young Kim. And so to do the honors of introducing our speaker, I get the honor of introducing our host and interview for tonight, Alex Cipolli. And we are very fortunate to have her here to, to, to do the interview and to introduce our speaker, Mick Young Kim. And, uh, and for Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota Public Radio for the sponsorship. So to do the honors, Alex, would you come up and introduce Mick Young? Thank you, Tom, and thank you to the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. I'm so honored to be here tonight and to introdu introduce Mick Young Kim. She is an, an inter international landscape architect and urban designer. She's the founding principal of Mick Young Kim Design in Boston. Her designs have been called poetic, playful, healing, and innovative. Her exceptional body of work explores the intersection of human health and environmental stewardship. It defines the art of ecology and restorative experiences. Her studio's work includes the restoration project on the Seoul River, the 42-acre Science Hill Wellesley campus, and Ford's Michigan Central Park in Detroit. In 2022, her firm won the American Society of Landscape Architects National Design Award, and she has received the Cooper Hewitt, I'm sorry, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Award. Fast Company called her architecture firm one of the most innovative in the world. Please join me tonight in welcoming Mick Young Kim. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. Um, yeah, it's such an honor to be here. I think um, in 2020, I had to make a sad phone call to say, I think um, I'm not going to be able to come and give a lecture. <laughs> There seems to be a pen global pandemic out there, but maybe I'll come in the fall. <laughs> and then I had to make another phone call in the fall and say, maybe I'll come in the spring of 2021. And so I'm here today, and I'm honored to be here, um, kicking off this in-person lecture. There are seats down here, so feel free to come down. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, what we do as urban designers and landscape architects and just designers in general. Um, we've had a lot of time over the last three years to think about this. And um, I think for us, for me, um, as a landscape architect, let me just introduce myself. So we, we have a mid-sized firm. We have 35 people based in Boston. And I've been in practice for 27 years now. So, you know, two and a half decades. Um, and I think that the last couple of years have been just so strange, but also really interesting for landscape architects because um, we've really started to think about um, what we call, what I'd call a life in balance, right? Um, how do we, start to understand the symbiotic relationship between ecological systems, resiliency, ecological resiliency, and then human resiliency. You know, they're all intertwined. And I think um, it's something that I want to talk about today. It's a kind of like, what is the ethical foundation of the work that, that we do? And it's become very clear. Um, in our practice over the last three years. This is the very first project I ever worked on. We did it pro bono. I was a young professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. I was fortunate enough to, to do the work that was meaningful. And um, anyone who tells you when they are 24 that they 
know what's meaningful for the rest of their life, <laughs> they're lying to you. Um, but I think there's an instinct. And for me, I was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. I am the symbol of the American dream. My parents emigrated from South Korea and raised me and taught me to be a good citizen. And I, um, I was the only minority in my whole elementary school. And so it was a very unique upbringing in the 70s. And um, I think that instinctually I was drawn to reach out to underserved, under-resourced neighborhoods and to work with them um, to manifest their voice. So I did a number of these kind of civic parks and playgrounds in Hartford, Connecticut, and worked with these wonderful kids. They were amazing. Um, and learned how to work with communities. The other group of people that I became drawn to um, as a kind of ethical boundary for our practice was, um, at that time, some of our most fragile people in our population. There are patients in pediatric uh, hospitals. And they're wonderful. They're amazing, um, optimistic, um, hardworking, um, very authentic people. They're, and so when you, when for us, what, what does it mean to have an ethical practice and to do things that are meaningful to us? It's really that you meet your client group and you just want to do the best job you can for them. So these stories are, I was born at Prentice Hospital. I was rushed over um, to the Lurie Children's Hospital. And I never went outside for a year. I had three heart transplants as a, as a baby. You know, you, you just, it's like there's nothing more meaningful than that. And then we all became fragile three years ago. And we all became much more empathetic to this other population that, you know, my studio, we've been working with this population for, for a long time. What we found, um, I think it was 16 years ago, there were a series of psychological research papers that came out that, that showed that within five minutes on average, our brain and body function normalize um, when we are engaging with the natural world. In fact, even when we see a painting of the natural world, um, our brain function normalizes, meaning electrical function, um, blood pressure, heart rate, all of that normalizes. And we all know this, right? You go for a walk around the lake, you start to feel a little bit better. Um, so this happened, right? And it's still happening. And then this happened, right? And I promise this is not going to be a dark lecture. Um, but I think we learned that these are all really important things. Well, this is what I learned through this. Um, that as landscape architects and as urban designers, we have the capacity to really, to really start to change things culturally and ecologically. So it's that symbiosis that I talked about earlier. And we work, we choose, even though we no longer work in these kind of small playgrounds per se, we choose cities that are majority minority cities to work in. So today we're working in Houston, which is the most diverse city in America. We're working in Detroit, which is a majority minority city. Um, this is in Houston. And there is, a, for those of you who are not landscape architects, there is a topographic relationship that actually um, is tied to socioeconomic status. So the lower that you live, the more likely you're going to live here, the more vulnerable you are. So there's that kind of connection again. How do we start to bring resiliency to people's lives? So I started with the picture of the children. And, and so what we love to do is to bring 
to bring design in and to understand how we can take that ethical stance and transform people's lives on a regular and an everyday basis. This is a, a project in Seoul, Korea. It's a river that we restored. And then the most important thing is how do we bring wonder and play and, um, and just kind of a sense of character to the places that we design. So, you know, within, I've selected a few projects. I, I tried to find some regional projects from our portfolio so that it kind of connected with our audience. But I wanted to start off with the two projects that we did uh, very early on in our practice. And this is really for a lot for the students in some ways, which is um, for us, we are not um, a practice that, that does university work or that does healthcare work. We're really a, a practice that's really interested in creating in um, projects where the client or the, the community does not know what the question is yet. And part of our job is to help them figure out what that question is. I think that's really important as a kind of boundary. So this is in Seoul, Korea, South Korea. And it's a population of 22 and a half million people. So just to give you a little scale, that's about eight times more dense than New York City. Um, people living on top of people living on top of people. If you ever, it's like Hong Kong. You walk down the sidewalk and it's dense. Um, and we were, we, we were awarded this in a competition. It's a seven mile river corridor um, that, let me see if I, my pointer works, that starts, and it's a historic stream, seasonal stream, which the spring was originally located here. And it basically kind of comes around and, and then dumps into the Han River. Our project wasn't just about restoring this river and uncovering this river, but it was also about these yellow lines of kind of bringing the city, stitching the city back together again. So in 1910, you can see what this river looked like. It was hundreds of years of raw effluence sort of pouring into this river, such that it became a, a symbol of poverty. This uh, stream was originally the reason why Seoul was located as an amenity, um, and then it became a symbol, a problematic symbol for the city. So what you can see on your right is in the mid 20th century, as in many cities, they actually covered it with a highway, which had a lot of, there were a lot of issues. So you take this natural amenity and then you make it into something that's impervious, that, um, that also divides the city because a lot of it was elevated. So this is the kind of, from 1970, and then kind of bringing it back to a greenway and a stream. So it, it's a kind of really muscular infrastructure project. And so I'm going to try to see if I get this. There we go. And so imagine this was a highway. And what this did, what this did for seven miles is a, it has, to us in America, this, and to you here in Minneapolis, this feels small. But in South Korea, with 22 million people, this is a very generous give back to the community. And what it's done is it, it's, um, it's really transformed the city in, in many ecological ways. So with urban heat island effect, um, transforming water quality, and reducing air, um, air pollution, you know, and, and many other things, bringing biodiversity back into the city. Um, oops, sorry, this is a very sensitive mouse. And through this project, because I was in my late 20s when I did this project, which seems incredible, um, I, uh, I also learned that place is a foundation for culture, building culture and building neighborhoods. 
So within the first three years of building this project, 20 million people had visited this project. It is a place for art, it's a place for performance, um, it's a place for learning um, in the kind of Montessori style of learning. Like you, you see a crane walk by. I think that's a crane walk by. Um, and it's also a place of resiliency. So downtown Seoul um, during the monsoon seasons would completely flood. And every year there would be calculations of deaths and damage. And, so essentially you'll see like, and this is flash flooding with climate change. It's just really happens very quickly. And what this project does is it basically uh, protects the city. And it, it takes about 22,000 surficial tons of surficial runoff from the city every day. Not this, but just every day. So it, it takes this kind of urban runoff and then brings it into this amenity. It is a drop down um, up to six meters to accommodate that and to create that resiliency. And at first when we designed this we were against it because in America you don't drop things down. Um, but in East Asia if you've been there a lot of things happen underground. Shopping malls are underground. There's a kind of real efficiency about things. But what I didn't know, um, which our engineers kind of uh, showed us, is that you can see these are those yellow lines right here. These are the connectors. And this is the stream that runs below. And, and they, we, together, the complex team that we worked with, we built these historic bridges. So underneath, there's a, a way in which people can kind of come down into this river experience the kind of cooling effects of the river, and then come back up into the city. It is an urban beach. And it is a place where your voice can be heard. This is the million person march. Mm, I don't know if you remember um, President Park she was doing some shenanigans, and people got really mad. And um, this Seoul River is a, was a place where people could come together and um, kind of say their piece. So at the same time, in the same room, when we were designing that project, we were also designing this project. And I wanted to find the most contrasting uh, work to kind of talk to everyone about, like, when we're designing things, we're looking at very different designs, very different scales. And for us, that's a kind of ethos that we really love because it challenges us. We're not trying to replicate the same work in each project. This is a garden. It's an 11-acre garden in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Um, this is Farrar Pond, which is one of the ponds that links to Walden Pond. So it's a very famous site. Um, and I, all I'm going to talk about today is this like squiggly red line that you see here. And so we went from a project I just showed, which is like taking 22,000 tons of surficial runoff and kind of bringing people through the city to this was for five people and two dogs. And that red line was essentially a dog run fence. So the way in which we conceived of that fence is that it came to the site as something that was flexible and scrunched down with these bolts. And they basically opened this up and they poured the footings as, as, uh, as they opened up the fence so that it, it kind of formed with the land, the Cayman cattle landscape that this was. And so essentially, the fence itself is solid core 10 units. There's five different sizes, so it's a modular system. 
So you can see that here. It's quite thick as a fence. And this, um, this is a view from the side. And in this project, we, we feel like we learned a lot because we were trying to make a garden that had no lawn in it on 11 acres. So this is our solution for a, a backyard. Um, and this is the fence that like sort of weaves through this landscape. And the other thing we learned, well, let me see what the next slide is. Um, and so the dimension from here to here is actually um, Lesko, who is the German Shepherd's dimension shoulder to shoulder. So the first um, fall that this was completed, the client invited us to come and have dinner at their house. And they were um, baby dog sitting a miniature dachshund. And the dachshund had to go out for a little pee, for a little wee, and went right through the fence. <laughs> and we were like, come back. So it's a very customized fence. <laughs> But we were really interested in how um, an element that's very utilitarian could become something sculptural and also become something that's like, um, it's like a guide, guidepost or something for the landscape so that in the fall, um, the leaves transform in color and sort of meet this fence. And then in winter, it becomes the star of the show. And we all know that our winters are long. And so to give some glimmer of hope during that period is always nice. We do a lot of work with patients and clinical institutions. Um, and I'm really interested in the brain. We know very little about it, but I'm very interested in it. And I think that there's a lot of research out there which shows that as designers, we have the capacity to really kind of be part of the clinical healing process. It's not just like the soft healing garden concept, but I think that there's a real, there's, there have been some real breakthroughs to talk about how uh, the environment that we inhabit actually makes a difference. And the first place where that mattered was in hospitals because they really are trying, they have a very tough job. And so once there was some research out there which said, you know, if you put some gardens in your hospitals, you actually will help with the healing process. Um, and it's, I know that it's not a soft argument. The very, this was the very first project we worked on in Chicago. Um, it's for the Crown Sky Garden at the Lurie Children's Hospital. And we spent about a year discussing for this 7,000 square foot garden, which was on the interior, and then a 2,000 square foot garden above it, which was the tree house. Is it, what is the value of that if you're spending $18 million on this versus the value of two MRI machines? And they chose this because there was enough research. And Hospital administrators would never just do things for fun, right? <laughs> there, was enough, there was enough research about retention of staff and caregivers and about the process. And from this moment, we found that um, now every hospital, it's, it's, it's a part of the kit of parts of building a new hospital. So, at Boston Children's Hospital, we're now building, we're currently building eight new gardens for them. So they really believe in it. Um, I learned about community process through, through this work. So I believe in a community process that's not, a, I mean, it has analytics in it, but that it's really about getting to know people. And people have said to me, well, how can you do that when you're working on a big park? And we are working on a 47-acre park in Houston that's completing construction this fall. We're working on a 14-acre park in Detroit. It is possible. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But these were, like this woman, 
We met her in ninth grade, and she'd had four heart transplants. Um, she loves tilapia. And at the opening, she had just gotten into nursing school. I mean, that is the ethics of a practice, is that you get to know the people um, and their aspirations, and you design for that. This is a picture of um, an aspiration we had for the project, which is to bring people into the design of the project itself. So you see these kids, and they, they have their hands in this pink, viscous material. It is cold. It's goopy. And you have to hold your hands still for about three to five minutes for, for you to get like all the textures of your fingerprint. And so um, in this community process, we said, I said, well, let's get a few babies, a few five-year-olds, a few third graders, and then on and on. And when I got to Chicago, I thought, oh, gosh, I hope some people show up. And there was a line around the room, like I was Mr. Rogers or something. <laughs> and there were some pretty aggressive moms who were like, you are going to get your hand in that garden if it kills me. <laughs> I was like, OK. So I, I said, let's start with the babies. And so the babies were like, you know, they, they had contraptions tied to them. They were so happy. They were so. They were laughing, and then the minute they put their hands in this goopy, cold material, they just started wailing, like, wah! And I just, I felt so terrible. I said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should, like, uh, let's go to the next. And they're like, no, 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 give them another chance. <laughs> it's like, so, um, these kids, we, we got a solution. These kids are watching SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants, so. Um, we got away. And so, let's see. And so we, we also try to find materials that are not like you specify these materials, and then some contractor comes and brings them. So in this project, um, we waited for this wood, and it fell during a storm. I got a call from the urban forester in Chicago who was super excited, and I was super grumpy because I was like, why are you calling me at 11 o'clock? And he said, there are four trees that were planted by Frederick Law Olmsted during the Columbian Exposition of 1897. Do you want some of it? And I was like, yes! <laughs> I had to share some of it with other museums in, in Chicago, but it was fine. <laughs> and this is the project. You know, there are all these other things that I'm not going to talk about today, but it's in, there are, so I just want to show contrasting projects, like how in every project, we try something new. So in this project, we had to create surfaces that were easy to clean and created play where you didn't have to touch. So this play is um, based on speed. You can see up here, oh, you can't see it. Um, there's a little sensor up here, which basically tracks the speed of movement. And so the faster you move, the more colorful the lights get and the more active it, the and then these are basically planters, but they light up from within. And then this is the tree house up above. And this is really for the patients who um, reserve this room, and they come in with their families individually because they can't come down. This is a, a marble wall. Um, we had a fountain in here. And then in Houston, there was a case of Legionnaire's disease and they attribute it to an open fountain. So after we'd finished construction documents, we said, well, what if we take like those bubblers? You guys have probably seen them in the hospitals. They have these, like, they're, they're, there's often oil in them. Um, and we put marbles in them. And so when the, those bubblers come up through the marbles, you, um, it's like, it's sort of like an East Coast waterfront <laughs> experience. You hear the sound of things clinking together. I spent a lot of time selecting these marbles. It, it was so much fun. And to create that gradation, it matters. It does matter. At least to me, it matters. These are those hands. And so this is that wood. 
And so a question that was asked about the wood was, you know, a lot of the wood is rotted. Should we, they said they could take, it's sort of like hair transplants, you could take hair from another part of the body and put it like on top of your head. They said you can take wood from the inside and put it on the outside and you would never even know that there was like rotting wood. And I just thought, oh, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't feel right. And I think I realized that healing often leaves a scar. And that's an important part of that healing process. And so this um, fabricator helped us kind of embed um, ochre colored resin to capture that. And in fact, after um, we, when he was installing it, he showed me that he had actually put some dead bugs in there that kids could find as well, <laughs> which I loved. I thought it was very sweet. It, I made sure they weren't alive when they were in there. Um, but you see this little dot um, when a kid puts their hand on there. There's actually an opening down here, and you can actually hear the sound of water coming out of the log when you put your hands on there. So little details like here's the hand. When you cast a hand, you would get the relief. So we rely on our fabricators to ask us these questions like, do you want the relief or do you want the cast of the cast? And I realized, no, we want the cast of the cast because you want to be able to cradle your hand inside of there. So this was a project that taught us about details, how that matters and how people engage a space. This is a view from the Prentice Women's Hospital across the way. Um, our project in Detroit, this is for the Ford Motor Company, and the question was, how do you build a part of the city, we're doing 14 acres here, when you start to imagine a world where you do not have gas-powered vehicles, that all mobility is EV. But this is an interesting project because in the 1920s, it was the main portal into Detroit, the train station. Trains used to be really important ways in which we got our food, fuel. And when we started our community process there, um, there, uh, let me go back. So the community that lives over here, it's called Mexican Town. And the community that lives over here, it's called Cork Town, which is mostly white, younger. Um, and, and the train station really divided these two communities, and it does so today. But a lot of the community members in Mexican Town said, my great-grandfather came in through this train station to come to America. This is why it's so important to talk to people, because you never get these stories through analytics only. And so this is a portal of, of history, of memory, for many people in the community and a very uh, active train station. I'm not going to talk about the project today in detail, but I just want to talk about what's the ethics behind it, what was important as we were building the foundation. So the sustainability piece was really about kind of um, improving air quality, cooling down the air. You can see you know, our site is right here, right here. We are in the heart of noise pollution, um, kind of, uh, there was no permeability on the site, and with the client, we've committed to an 80% permeability for this park. So it's a unheard of level of permeability, and just um, integrating biodiversity into the project. And then this is that symbiotic condition. So when you plant 550, wait a second, that was 600 trees. And it dropped to 550 from one side to the next. Um, I will get back to you on that. <laughs> um, I believe it is 550 trees. Um, what does that do for us as humans? Because I think um, we, we often, as landscape architects, look at ecology as almost separate from us because we know that we have the power to destroy the systems that we rely on. And we know that today. And so how do we start to rebuild those systems? 
And in this project, I think we want to, it's not enough just to argue, well, it's good. I think it is much more powerful. It's like that hospital, the hospital administrator example I gave. Um, it's much more powerful to say, if you create um, a smart lighting system and a smart traffic management system, you actually help with childhood obesity. And it's proven in other cities. So this is what we do. We try to tie it all together and to say, this is doing good for us as in this kind of symbiotic way. Within our studio, we have a research um, uh, group. And that research group has been focused on this notion of neurodiversity. I could give an entire lecture on that, but I will not. But I am very interested. So it's tied to that ethical foundation I talked about up front, which is in the uh, late 90s, I was searching out people who no one was interested in designing for, right? Inner city kids who didn't have a place to play. And right now, I've been very interested, and our, our office has been very interested in designing within and beyond the spectrum. Like, we all have different brains. We all have different ways in which we think, and we accept the world. How can we create a 14-acre park that's not just for kids who come and play soccer? And you know, we, when we program parks, we always program for, for kind of a certain um, neurological condition. And so we've been doing a lot of research to understand how we create places. And I, I think when I look, when I, each time I read this, I think maybe I'm on the spectrum as well, because I am drawn to these spaces of, as well. We have recently looked at also some studies about girls and boys and the ways in which they engage um, public space and where they feel comfortable. Um, and so just trying to, what do we call inclusion and diversity? It's, it's actually in the body. Um, and so, you know, it's a project that is inspired by the history of the tracks, but also building on that history, integrating some of the latest technologies of how we create a landscape and create a landscape that's responsive. And our attitude towards this after working on this for two and a half years is this, that the more advanced the technology gets, the smaller it gets, the more responsive it gets, and the more it allows for us to design parks which are responsive to us as humans, which allow for us to make it more, eco more ecological. So this is a multi-leveled landscape that we're continuing to design. <coughs> it has a four-acre um, stormwater management system, and it is one of the gateways to the project. So um, the Ford Foundation is incredibly committed to this, and it's something that we're really interested in. Another thing we're looking at is ways in which we can use technology to create flexibility in the design of public spaces. So we're starting to look at these um, units of landscape that can actually be automated and slide. So you, we've all been to these giant plazas, right? We have one in Boston, which is Boston City Hall, that if the Patriots win the Super Bowl, it's a very successful plaza. <laughs> but they haven't won the Super Bowl in a few years. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a pretty inhumane space. So how do we use technology to create these kind of sliding platforms that are using the technology that Amazon uses to move um, boxes? We're talking about that in this project. Last project is in Chicago, so last Midwestern project. This is at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and we were asked to design um, a nature learning center and garden. It's um, seven acres. And um, 
This is the aerial view. Um, but see that pink dot? That is the location of our garden. And um, it is within the um, Skokie River watershed. And when there is a flash flood, there is a flash flood. It fills um, most of the garden. And so we wanted to embrace resiliency here. And you can see this is a, a flash flood event, and our garden is located right here. So it is, um, and that is right here. So this goes back to the first project I showed you, whereas this is a green basin. The other one was mostly um, a masonry basin. And so water collects in this landform and then slowly percolates out. And so it creates resiliency for other parts of the garden. But it's an exercise, this is for the students in the audience, of cut and fill. We equalize cut and fill after we learn the cost of moving the soil off site. And so in the end, these uh, sculptural mounds became a kind of resolution of something that was a cost issue. And this is a stream that runs through the project that um, then goes back into the lake. So one thing, um, I, in each project, I tried to pick one thing that might be interesting or poetic to talk about. And in this uh, project, we really thought about like what does it mean to engage the natural world and to learn from it? And what does that mean for children? And so um, some of it is you know, being on site and people telling you what what you should know, or engaging with it directly. But part of it is selecting a plant palette that allows for a child to kind of pick up a seed and kind of slide it into their pocket and take it home and put it by their bedside as a kind of, I always think of the beach as a, as a kind of equal symbol where it's the, it's the experience of the beach is so wonderful. And then it's also the sand that you take with you on the bottom of your feet when you come back home. It's that memory and the resonance. So all of our plants are, are selected with that in mind. Designing for a botanical garden is like designing for the Museum of Modern Art. You know they're going to take care of it. And you can select plant material that no one else can take care of. Um, these are wood logs that were on site, and um, you know they either fell or taken down during the construction. And so this was a, a wonderful project because we could talk about play in a way where we could say, this is going to degrade, and eventually this won't be here, um, which I think is the best kind of play, rather than the kind of structures we have today which is a whole nother lecture, but I'll just do a second, which is the same playground you guys have is the same playground we have that they have in Houston, Texas, and they probably have in Seoul, Korea. And I would bet $100 or maybe a little bit more money <laughs> that that affects our children, right? Because that's the moment where my husband's a physician and he told me, your brain starts to stops growing when you're 28. <laughs> it's very depressing, but um, it means that you know when you're young, there's so much to learn, and play is an important part of that. This is a program. Um, uh, the Botanic Garden is in Glencoe, which is about 20 miles north of Chicago, and what they do. Um, is they have a summer program where they bring in high school students from Chicago who don't have access to the natural world in the same way. And they get to kind of wade through the river and study things and tumble down the landforms. So in the end, I think, you know, it, it's, I come back to this notion of the life and a life in balance, right? And so I, I was thinking, like, how do I close this? And I was just thinking, you know, when you're younger, you think, oh, if I could just win that award, uh, I'm going to be a different person. I'll be so happy. Not that I wasn't happy when I was younger, but like you, you have these artificial goals. And you say, if I could just win the Cooper Hewitt, then my life will be so different, and I will be so happy. 
But what I've realized since then, since I did win some of these awards, is first of all, your life really doesn't change that much. And secondly, that it, if you have this kind of ethical foundation that guides the work that you do, whether you have a pandemic or whether whatever happens, you have a reason why you're doing what you're doing. And so I think that that's the way I want to close it. And I want to thank everyone very much for coming. I know we're going to have a Q&A session, but thank you so much. So it was really clear in your presentation that you and your firm have a commitment to community. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's been following the field, um, community engagement has become a buzzword. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of firms tout themselves for being engaged in their communities, but often that looks like maybe meetings tagged on later in the process before or after decisions, major decisions have been made. Um, so what does real meaningful community engagement look like? an equitable engagement, because we know that not everybody can attend a 7 p.m. meeting um, or right. spend a lot of time in these activities. So tell us how your firm does equitable engagement. Well, I think the first thing is it's tailored for each community. We don't have a formula that we use, because each community is different. So I think it's getting to know the decision makers who understand the community, and we design a community engagement around that. Doing it early is very important for us as designers, because if we can meet people and we can get inspired by their stories, then that re is reflected in the work. So we never want to like come to a community. I feel afraid if I have to do this, like come to a community and show a finished design. I feel like I'm not being authentic. Mm -hmm. And why drag everyone out of their homes if we're already done? Right. You know, I, I'm not interested in that. But I think um, we've been working with Wellesley College, and so that's a very unique community. It's 99.9% .9 women. Um, uh, and we, we started with a process that we designed with the faculty, and, and then we found that the students weren't, engaging. And this is one of the times where I think like we learned something through the, during the pandemic that was very effective, which is doing these kind of hybrid community meetings where you have Zoom. Mm. It actually is very good for um, underprivileged neighborhoods, communities, because they can't come at 7 o'clock with their two kids. And so we have these great community meetings where you see like a kid run behind somebody while they're talking, and it's wonderful. Um, and so the, it's more inclusive when you do it hybrid or you do everything. But we did this meeting where we pulled everyone apart in Zoom. We decided we wanted everyone to be in Zoom. We pulled everyone apart by type. So alumni were in one room, room, um, students were in another room, and faculty and administrators. And we chose a person from each room to then report back to the larger group at the end. Mm. So we kind of gave that back. We, and I usually pick the quietest person in the room. I give them warning. I don't like make them do it by surprise. <laughs> but they're often, um, you know, they're often the people you don't hear in a community meeting. And so we had this community meeting. And it's recent, so it's fresh in my mind. And even towards the end, it was still very polite. And there were probably 120 people on this call. And, um, and I just said, does anyone have any last comments? And one student got up, and she started. She said, uh, you know, the mo I said, can someone talk about like a very powerful event hmm. on campus that they've had? And she talked about like, how she was walking to class, and she saw this hawk come down, grab a mouse, and kill it in front of her. And I was like, oh, OK, so anyways, uh, so we're going to be wrapping this up. But it was incredible. The entire room of 100 people lit up, alumni. And they all had like nature, killing stories. 
And it was like, um, it made me realize, like I learned something very powerful that Wellesley College is in this place that's not like Harvard University. It is a place where things, you discover something every day when you walk, walk to class. And they, we came up with the word, the wander, as the idea behind the project from three different community engagements. So that's the goal, is to like just talk to people, do analysis, and then eventually say, it's about the wander, because it's about that discovery. But it's, it was in the last like 10 minutes of that meeting, or else we wouldn't have caught it. We wouldn't have known. So mm. it is, it's about relationships mm -hmm. and creating a platform that people feel comfortable sharing something to you that they may think is unimportant. Mm -hmm. But to you, it's like the great grandfather who came through the train station. You just thought, wow, how many people have relatives who came in through that train station and like a third of the room raised their hand and then we realized, wow, oh my gosh, this is a portal. This is a historic portal. Oh, wow. So that's what we're trying to find. We're not trying, I mean, we do get everyone's opinion, mm -hmm. but we're trying to find the poetics in the community and they give it to us. We don't know when we walk in what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's trial and error in many ways. So on the other end of that spectrum of engaging with communities, yeah. um, I used to work at the College of Design in Oregon, which housed the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. And one of the struggles that they had was removing the silos between disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and that became a major pinch point with the pandemic. Um, right. And so a lot of uh, designers for the first time were speaking with scientists and doctors mm -hmm. and everything. And since you have designed a lot of healthcare spaces and healing spaces, I was wondering if you could talk about the collaboration between different fields in your design. We collaborate at every phase of our work. From the beginning, we're like students when we start. And we, we pretend not to know much, to really get as much as we can we know that the community often relies on us to kind of manifest their ideas into a design. So we, we're confident that we have a role when we sit in the room. But you, even when we are at the end, the fabricators will often come in and they'll put a bug in our project, right? <laughs> and it's wonderful, you know, I love it. So it enriches the work. So it is this balance, like I think there's a, maybe a misnomer, like some people do community engagement and everybody has a voice and everybody says something and you try to achieve all of it. And I think in design, sometimes you end up with nothing mm -hmm. because you're trying to manifest everything. But what we're trying to do is condense and try to find something that's universal to that community. And that's a design process in itself, to try to figure that out. Um, but it takes time, you know, and not everybody has the patience for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I'm personally interested in it because I'm not a cocktail party person. Like, I don't go out and party every weekend and meet new people all the time. And so this is a venue by which I can meet people and they bear their soul to me. They're like, and my child, you know, the first walk they took here. And, and so as a landscape architect, they share things with me that they wouldn't ordinarily if they met me on the street. And it's, it's kind of a privilege because um, I don't usually get that. And so I really search for it and try to quantify what it means in design, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you were showing some images of the pandemic, but also of Black Lives Matter, and um, you know, just kind of like the social justice and equitable movements happening. I was curious what, what you think the role of parks and public spaces, what role do they have in the land back movement? Yeah. 
I think it's a very, I think, I always think about this, like there are two politicians who've said something about cultural change. Mm -hmm. One is Jimmy Carter, and he said, during the energy crisis, I don't know if anyone will remember this, he, <laughs> he said, put a sweater on. Do you guys remember that? And he got in big trouble. <laughs> but he was right. You know, if we all just wore a sweater and turned down the temperature a couple degrees. And then Obama said, you know, cultural change is slow and we're impatient, right? It's like trying to turn an ocean liner around. So you're <laughs> and that's the way I feel, is that we're trying to turn an ocean liner around. And every moment, it can be just two people meeting, might be enough, but it is those moments where you create places. Like in Detroit, what we're trying to do is create a diversity of places that offer neurodiversity, it offers for many different people. And that is a larger topic that brings many different skin colors into the discussion. So for me, I think I'm really interested in how do we go beyond like um, the tagline, like um, inclusion. Like mm -hmm. I don't even know what that word means anymore, or diversity, and I try not to use it very much. I try to be more specific in projects, like here is how we bring people who differ together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very simple thing. <laughs> Um, how do you get people who don't agree to talk to each other? It's more and more a difficult task, but the one place you're most likely to do it is in the civic realm. Mm -hmm. Because people walk their dog and you don't know what they read online when they go home, right? <laughs> and that's yeah. great, right? It's the moment where you talk to people who you may not agree with. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that's our simple job, is to create places that get people to engage with each other. Um, there's a new sport that's a rage in Detroit. It's called fouling. How many people know what fouling is? Mm -mm. It's football and bowling together. <laughs> so you take a football and you throw it at bowling pins. <laughs> and wow. it is so popular, and we did a test um, last year, and that was, we realized that's a program that's going to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that before we designed the park mm -hmm. was so helpful because you need these long, thin spaces. We didn't design specific things. You could do bocce ball in there, you could do, but we saw that as something that's so new that white, black, Hispanic, people, everyone was coming together. And oh my gosh, let me try that, you know? And that, that's what you're trying to do. I, I think just to say this is, I think part of it is also design. Like making amazing places that people remember and they want to go back to. And they want to, when someone comes in from out of town, you want to take them there. Mm -hmm. That's an important component that I think landscape architects don't talk enough about. When they talk about our work, they call it art. And I take offense at that because they try to marginalize it. But I think it's really important to make these places that you just got to go to. Mm -hmm. Because landscapes are not places that you got to go to. Like the hospital, you got to go see your doctor. Or the library, if you're checking out a book, if anybody still checks out books. But, um, but parks, you have to earn your keep to get people to keep coming back. Um, so it's a roundabout way of answering <laughs> your question. But <laughs> Fouling. I think here right now it's pickleball. Everybody's playing pickleball. pickleball. Yeah. Pickleball is big, but it is not inclusive. Sorry. As far as our research has shown, plus it's a makes a very annoying sound. <laughs> and you laugh, but it's actually quite important to create inclusive parks. Because if you can hear them playing pickleball on one side of a 14-acre park, and the sound is very annoying. It's like, 
I can't even make it. It's not a humanly possible <laughs> made sound, but it's, um, you, you can hear it everywhere. And it makes it difficult for neuro, neurodiversity mm -hmm. engagement. Anyways. Uh, we have a couple questions okay, from the great. audience. Uh, number one, how did you find landscape architecture? Ah. Because actually one of my questions was, you have a background in music and studio art. That's right. So yeah, how did you come to landscape architecture? So who asked that question? You have to raise your hand, because I have to know who I'm speaking to. OK. <laughs> um, I actually trained to be a, a classical and jazz pianist. I went to Oberlin Conservatory. And this is going to be a little like the Oprah show. Um, <laughs> And I developed tendonitis in my left arm. Um, and so my junior year in college, in conservatory, I had to take six months off from playing, from, from communicating in the way that I'd communicate since I was like five years old. And so from there, well, I first had a meltdown, because I think I was like 19 or 20. and. Um, I worked for a public artist for the summer. Her name's Athena Taka, and helped her build an installation in Cambridge along the Charles River. And the day that we opened it, and all these, and there we had like a dance performance. I realized I could see the connection between music as a performative act and this thing that we built. And then from there, I found landscape architecture. So it was a kind of circuitous route. But I do believe that there's a cadence to the natural world that's very much like music. It has a rhythm. It has color. And so the tools you use to design a landscape is very much like the tools. I was listening to um, this documentary about Linda Ronstadt. Have you guys seen it? on my plane ride here. And honestly, I kind of wrote, I, I just watched it because it, I just watched it. But I'm not a Linda Ronstadt fan. I, I always thought she was, like, I didn't understand her. And, um, but she talked about when she developed Parkinson's, how with her voice, she lost the ability to express color and all the nuances. and I. I, I related to that, you know, that once you can't do that in music, you have to find another mechanism to do that through. Um, so, that's good. You know, I feel like that comes through in so many ways. Looking at that dog park yeah. that you designed, uh -huh. like one of the notes that I made was that feels musical to me. Yeah. There's a rhythm and repetition there. Yeah. Um, and also the forget which project it was, but where the color changes as mm -hmm. the children run faster or slower. And yeah, I was wondering how like your education in music and art informs those choices. I mean, sound is such an abstract thing, right? It, we're a, in Western society, we're a very visual culture. Mm -hmm. we, we rely, we're not like my dog. <laughs> My dog, when I give him something to eat, he smells it first before he looks at it, <laughs> before he puts it in his mouth. And I think um, we could do, I, and we, when I say we, I mean adults. Children are not like that. Children, they use all their senses equally. Um, so I think just, um, you know, you can play the piano and close your eyes. In fact, you often do it better when you do that because you, you shut out everything else. And I think we would all, I mean, the landscape is, has, is a multi-sensory experience. So maybe we should all do an exercise where we blindfold ourselves and walk with somebody else, but walk through a park this spring and see how that park differs in experience. The smells, touches, the sound. So we do design like um, we think about like we just designed this healing garden, which is an aspen grove, and the sound throughout the seasons. That's part of the idea, and then um, so it's I think to be able to think abstractly mm -hmm. 
is the way, is what music taught me, is how to see things, yeah, more, because music is very abstract, but it's also, I, I usually show brain and I show the amygdala, so you should all go home and look and see where the amygdala is. But music is the place which reaches your amygdala when it's really powerful. So the thing that makes you, you, you've probably all experienced this when you hear music and you start to feel like you're going to cry. And you're like, why? Why is this happening to me? And it's because that sound, it's not just sound, but somehow the combination of those sounds have entered into your cochlea, into your brain, and reached your amygdala. And suddenly you feel an emotion. In some ways, that's what we're trying to do in, in design. We want to reach your amygdala <laughs> and get you to laugh, to cry, to run towards it. That's so cool. <laughs> I love that. Uh, this is a question I had for you as well. Uh -huh. And you can't choose your own project. OK. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite park and why? Oh, oh, I see. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering what the, you can't choose your own project. Um, one of my favorite parks, now I've forgotten what it's called. It's in Italy. Um, you guys may know it. It's the one with all the water in it. Um, Villa d'Este. Who said that? <laughs> oh my gosh, first question and right answer. Um, <laughs> that's a park I really love because it is, it's a park that it basically takes, a, it's a crazy place. It takes a stream and basically kind of changes the shape of the water. And there's a giant fountain at the bottom. And so it's not a fountain fountain. It's actually taking natural water and it transforms it. But it's, it's a multi-sensory experience. So that is one of the places I go back to again and again because it's so powerful. It's, um, and I love water. I think water is such an essential part of the landscape. We don't get to use it as much as we want to because it's very expensive, very expensive to maintain. Um, but I think that's one of my favorite parks. Um, I, I also like this playground. And I'm not ready for this question, so I don't have the names of these spaces, but I think it's called Lionsgate Park. And it's designed by, it's in um, Georgia, somewhere in the south. And it's basically all these recycled barrels mm. that are all at these different levels. And, and it's a different kind of playground. Mm -hmm. And you can actually like beat against them and different sounds emerge from it. So it's like an instrument as well. And I love the idea of the design because it's designed by a consortium of designers and students. So if you're interested in what it's called, I will look it up when I go home, and I will pass it on to you. <laughs> OK. Here is another question. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes clients don't know what questions they are asking. Mm -hmm. What are some ways you help them uncover their questions? Um, so when people don't, when clients don't know what the question is, sometimes it's like, I don't know where the site ends. I do not know where the site ends. So Wellesley was like that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where the boundary of your scope is. I love that. I just love it. And so we just say, well, let's not resolve that today. Let's figure out what you need and draw the boundaries a couple of times. Um, sometimes they don't know who the community is that, they're, that we're serving. And so we can help figure out who that consortium of people are. Um, and sometimes they just don't know what it should be. <laughs> like that's often, you know, like, I don't know, what is this? Like, and so we rarely do gardens, like gar private gardens, but that project we showed you um, at the interview when we met these very, very wealthy people, because that fence was about, in today's cost, might be four or five million dollars. Um, in fact, when we went to the community, um, the, 
the regulatory approvals process, they're like, have you ever heard of those electric fences? Because you could save a boatload of money if you don't build this. They're like, oh, I know. Um, is that we talked about Johann Sebastian Bach at our interview. And how can we create, so it's interesting you said you saw music in there, because I think that fence is actually very contrapuntal. And that's a whole nother lecture, but. <laughs> um, counterpoint is this idea that you create volumes of sound by um, stacking notes. So um, you don't increase volume by, by um, touching the notes harder. You do it by, because that's the instrumentation they had at the time. You could hit the harpsichord, you could touch it very lightly, and it's the same sound. So it's about stacking sound. And so I think that fence does do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it until you just mentioned it to me, but yes. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, another question is, uh, the project in Detroit, mm -hmm. this person says, is very exciting and ambitious with 80% permeable uh, surfaces. Surfaces, thank you. Tell us a bit about designing for the seasons, including winter, especially because you're talking to Minnesotans here. Yeah. So in that Detroit project, we are designing plant material around patch ecologies. Um, and so that naturally kind of yields seasonal interest because we're creating that. And so in some areas where, and the reason why I didn't show the project, I probably shouldn't, is this getting recorded? <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> is that I'm not allowed to show it yet, but maybe I'll come back and show the project and, and when it's built. Um, they're very secretive, as most larger um, corporations are. Um, uh, and so if we think of like the oak savanna patch ecology, we're making a garden with that. And so it guides us and allows for us to actually bring back plant uh, materials that may have, may not be available in nurseries today, but it, it kind of starts to create these, it's like um, sort of what you would do in a botanic garden, um, but it's really a way of bringing these kind of, these ecosystems to these communities that generally do not have them. Many of their parks are mostly lawn and, um, you know, it drives me a little crazy when I see, like, in our design magazines, they're like, oh, this is an ecological park, and I see it, and it's like 80% lawn, and I just think, well, you should dig a little deeper, because, <laughs> and I know why, because lawn is $8 a square foot, whereas a perennial garden is not just the cost up front, but it's that long-term commitment, so mm -hmm. I, I totally get it, but at the same time, I think we all, you know, it's like that. Um, and then it's defining new, new paradigms for beauty. So is a wetlands that has these kind of moving ochre grasses, because we don't cut our grasses till, till maybe next week, um, is that beautiful when the flower is gone? I think so. But universities used to think that was quite ugly. But these days, like at MIT, we're working with MIT right now, they're really into it. And we're going to replace probably 35, 40% of their lawn with more sustainable materials. And they're going to daylight all of their storm water. It's a different way of thinking of a university. Um, but they're a technology university, so that you know, we convince them why don't you show, right? Like, why, why are you trying to pretend this is something else, right? So thinking about the seasons, it's both aesthetic and also ecological. And they're, they're symbiotic. You know, nature, nobody does it better than the, than the natural world. Sometimes I have a little shack. Well, anyway, it's, it's, it's a house. Um, on the water in the North Shore. And I look at, I get to see the horizon line every weekend. And um, 
I think if I tried to paint that, it would look gaudy. But there's something about the way nature does things. And I think I've been trying to figure out what it is. One is that it's constantly changing, mm -hmm. right? You see that pink, bright pink line on the horizon for maybe two minutes, and then it disappears. Maybe that's what makes it so beautiful. Whereas if you fix it in a painting, then it doesn't have that power. So part of it is just really embracing change and that that's the beauty, is change. Sometimes in winter, we try to do what we do in that garden, that there's something that suddenly just shh appears, <laughs> right? This red Corten fence appears and then, then gets submerged back into the garden in the fall. But th it's just thinking about it, mm -hmm. yeah. It's beautiful. Well, thank you so much, thank you. Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.